I'm going to share with you some of my uh, projects that I've been working on in the, in the far north. As northern housing researcher, that means working north of 60. Um, and, you know, prior to being, uh, to working on these projects, I had never been to the far north and it is truly a spectacular area. Someone had mentioned one point about how it seemed like, uh, you know, working in some communities was like visiting a different country. Certainly visiting the north is like this. So, um, to me, sustainability means two things. It means both cultural and environmental sustainability. So in one sense, I've been working directly with communities, First Nations and Inuit communities, and all of the projects have involved a lot of participation from elders, women, and young people. Uh, and also it means environmental sustainability. So the all the projects have really tried to move the whole um, energy performance and, and, and uh, building um, durability in that of the of the houses significantly and, and each of the projects has, has had a significant impact on doing that in the territories themselves so this is a this is a picture of some of the places where I have worked across the north and I'm going to talk with you about projects in in Arviat and Nunavut in Dawson City Yukon Inuvik Northwest Territories and in a Anaktuvik Pass Alaska the North is, uh, to me, a very spectacular place, as I said, and, and um, you know, one of the things that's impressed me most about working there um, has been what I have found is the, the very deep, deep spiritual connection that the people have, the indigenous people have, with, uh, with the land, this land that they call their home. It, all the stories of their people, the stories of their, of, of their lives, um, I've always been very moved and, and very, um, taken by this connection and have learned a great deal from them about a long-term perspective of the environment and of the land that they live on that comes from that. That past picture is of, uh, of uh, the Yukon River in, in, um, uh, at Dawson City. This is this very same view in the winter. I mean, it's, it's amazing to sort of see it in the different seasons. And this is when uh, you can see the track across there is a winter ice road. Um, it was a week that I spent in Dawson City where the daytime high was minus 45 degrees Celsius. And, uh, and this, wind, this ice fog would rise from the river and come through town and you get this sort of low winter light. Um, as a photographer and an artist, I found it quite, quite spectacular. But of course, this, this land, this land of permafrost and intermittent permafrost um, is being very, very much affected by climate change and, and the impact that this has on buildings cannot be uh, sort of overstated. This is a shot of the uh, Northwest Territories, a, a, a place that I find of, of, you know, great, great lakes and, and rivers. Um, uh, a, a quite a vast, it seems like a very, very vast and uninhabited land in a way, but it isn't. You know, it's a place that's very much inhabited by the people, and and you see this happen during different seasons, such as the uh, the autumn when when you know instead of the colors where I'm from in Ottawa, where the colors are in the in the trees above you, the colors are all across the land uh, under your feet as people move out onto the hunting camps. You know, prepare for the for the uh, the autumn hunting season. And the same in the winter. There's always a connection with place and always a connection with the land. And this uh, shot of Nunavut on, on, on Baffin Island, dramatic landscape, uh, incredibly beautiful. And, uh, um, you know, I'm just, it, it's just a, an enormous place. And a place, too, it's not just the land, the skies, the, these skies that you get in the Arctic of soft, subtle colors, and, and it's very, very compelling. And in early winter, when, it, when the skies almost change to a pastel, uh, and it, it's it's absolutely gorgeous, and and the idea when you know the when the freeze up is coming, the ice is starting to form, and these patterns that you get onto the on the water. I share all this just because these are the things that I've found very compelling about this land. And as I said about the connection that people have with place, I was at a, a conference, a climate change conference in Iqaluit, and it was uh, the introduction to the conference was given by the mayor at that time. And the first words that she used at the beginning of her, her opening was that we are the air, we are the water, we are the land, we are the Inuit, welcome. So it was this notion of this strong connection to place that I think many of us in the South really cannot understand because it's something that's quite quite uh, emotional, quite spiritual, and, and very deeply connected. And, and whereas most of us from a wet, white Western culture, it's, you know, it's an intellectual thing. It doesn't have that feeling. So, climate change and the way it's affecting the North. Here's a quote, pack ice to the white man seems like a barrier, something to fear. 
but to the Inuit, it is their highway, their communication system, their freedom, their livelihood, their independence. So where we see and talk about the Northwest Passage opening up and it will make for more economic development in the North, the Inuit see it as a way that is as something that's threatening their whole way of life. So on these, uh, the projects I've been working on, we call the Northern Sustainable House, and they've had two, uh, this is to design a house that's culturally appropriate for the local community and has an energy performance that's 50% better than the model National Energy Code for Houses. This was actually our beginning point. All the houses we're doing are far more, even far more energy, energy performing than this. This is basically about 25% better than what the present R2000 standards are. But now we're doing houses that are about 50% to 60% better than, than that. And then um, to do a house design charrette, uh, we, the process involved doing a house design charrette, which was held in the community involving members of the community, uh, usually the housing corporation and, and, and tradespeople. We set up project design teams that were assembled that included um, myself from CMHC, local builders and local housing agency, and uh, then carried out uh, at the end of the project, each of these we carried out energy, we carried out energy modeling during the, the design and then energy modeling at the end of the project and see how well that they performed. So I consider this part of the cultural sustainability of the projects too, heavily involving people in the community. And a matter of fact, like this is something that I have been looking at more and more. And I believe one of my frustrations on these projects was never having quite enough time to do that, and it's a process that I think that really needs more attention rather than less. The inspiration for this, in many ways, comes uh, from this quote. Um, if we are to remain a strong people, we must educate our children and grow children in both the white and the clincho ways. They must be strong like two people. This is from Chief uh, Zimi uh, Bino of the clincho people who are uh, north of Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. So the first project is in Arviet, Nunavut, on the uh, shore of Hutton's Bay, a low-lying area uh, that uh, of, of a fascinating place when you look at it in terms of what may happen with climate change. If the oceans ra rise to the levels that they're talking about, this community will be underwater. I worked very closely with the elders in the community there, and they connected me with a lot of other people in the community as well. And they also shared all sorts of things, uh, stories about how life used to occur. One of the elders did all these drawings and, and he described how the different spaces were used in, in snow houses and igloos and how igloos could be expanded for the extended family and, and, uh, the, the, and the whole sort of way of life that came from that. And so we had uh, this kind of, it was interesting, we had a, a, I started this, uh, this charrette process bringing people in, talking around the table, and, and, and this, this one began as a one-day event and it ended up being a three-day event because I noticed the builders were very uncomfortable with every new idea that came up. You know, oh, we can't do that, that's gonna cost too much. No, we can't do that because, anyway, so I, I got them, I convinced them that uh, if they came for a second day, I asked them if they would like to come for a second day and they said, sure. So, so I said, all right, tomorrow we talk about how we're going to build all these things, all these ideas. And, and to make sure that we can. And they were comfortable with that, so then we moved forward. The third day was for Inuit women, because the women who came were not comfortable talking in this situation with everybody in the community. So we set up a separate day, invited a whole bunch of them to come, and uh, it worked out really, really well. And they provided all sorts of input that was, that was really good. This was a little drawing. I, I also facilitated this with a, with a guy named Joe Karatek, an Inuit facilitator in the community. And, and Joe was doing this sketch and talking about winter and summer and, and, and about how people, the, the, the slide on your right shows the different places where people live. The inter fascinating thing about the traditional life of the Inuit is that the longest time that they, that they lived in any one place was when they lived out on the ice. So their most permanent time of living was in a place of impermanence. And they would move far more in the summer when they would pick berries in a place fish for carp and a char in another place, and et cetera, et cetera. So this idea that suddenly they were living in one community and living in one dwelling that was both for all types of seasons was, was, was something that they realized, well, you know, what we need to do then is build a house for different seasons and build a house for different temperatures. And so that's what we started to look at doing. And also a house that would give spaces to deal with all these things that they didn't have space to deal with now. And this is the, pro this is the house that came out of it, uh, that, that it has a, a cold storage area when you enter in for storing your clo clothing when you come off the land. On the, um, on the very 
bottom left hand corner there's a room which is a sewing room it's inside the building envelope but insulated off from the rest of the house this room was designed to be kept five degrees celsius this is the room the inuit women in this community wanted because all of them sew skin clothing and the thing they said is the houses are too warm it, it, it makes the fur fall out and, and the stuff doesn't last. They wanted somewhere where they could carve meat and somewhere where they could sew, sew skin clothing. So that's what that is. They also wanted a large open concept. We got, we, it's interesting, this house did not take any larger floor area than the previous houses that were, that were being done because we got rid of hallways. People didn't like them anyway. They liked open concept. They liked rooms. They wanted a lifestyle where things were more connected. And they wanted a room where they could move furniture aside, put, you know, large piece, sheets of cardboard on the floor and, and, and sit around in circles and, and eat food in the traditional way. Um, and, and so that's what we tried to provide. Um, it's a well insulated house, very airtight. Um, R70 in the ceilings, R40, high R40s in the walls and the floor. Um, this is the, well, how the house looks. There's two of these. Uh, being constructed, neither of them are having solar panels put on them right now, but we've designed, we're doing all our houses now so that they're solar ready. These houses are um, two of them, one in structural insulated panels, one in a double wall construction being, cons being finished right now. And when they're done, we'll monitor them for a year to see how well that they perform compared to each other, compared to other houses in the community. Um, Dawson City, Yukon. Another project, we were working with the Trondac Wichin First Nation in Dawson. Uh, and Dawson is a very interesting town because it actually has a heritage, uh, an architectural heritage uh, 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 designation, because this was one of the communities that was uh, where the big gold rush was. And so there's lots of old towns, old buildings with front porches and things like that. And so there was, a, there was that sort of component that we brought into the houses as well. And the Trondike Witch and Worst Nation were building quite good houses, and, and uh, so what we basically did with them was try to, try to uh, improve on what they were doing, make the design work a little better, make the building uh, more energy efficient, and, and also did some flex housing um, uh, adaptability of it of as well. So this is an existing house. So this is the floor plan we came up. Again, you see there's a certain common element, large common open space. Um, we shrunk the hallways uh, quite uh, small and then you know, uh, uh, three, three bedrooms. The shaded area is an area on the porch and when we built this porch we insulated the floor, and the, the floor under the porch and the ceiling over the porch at the time of construction. And the idea was that any family that lived there, if they uh, decided that they needed more space, they could easily just by building some walls have an additional room that they could move into. So it was making, making the house flexible so that so the family, whoever moved in there, could continue living over a long period. Quite different from how the housing corporations sometimes look at this in the north because they don't see, they see social housing projects as just an intermittent stage. The First Nation, who built their own houses, saw this as houses for people in the community. And they wanted the houses so that people in the community could stay there. So this is how the building, uh, the house looks. Uh, some of the uh, energy reduction, southern orientation, small windows in the north, double wall construction, R40 floor and walls, R60 in the roof, triple glazed windows, high efficiency, direct vented boiler, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I have to go through these. There's a lot to look at, so I, I'll keep moving along. But when we, model, when we monitor it, the house came in at 25% better, better than the uh, model national energy code in its usage. Um, we had some overheating problems uh, with, a, with a boiler um, that was oversized and properly, improperly installed and things like that. And, and, and it's interesting, the, the following project, and that's a shot of the house at the bottom, the following project that I'm going to show you in Inuvik built on this idea. So we moved from a single family house into a duplex in order to then use only one heating system for both sides of the house. And that way our system was not oversized and we gained uh, additional efficiencies. And that house is in, in Inuvik, in uh, Northwest Territories, just above the Arctic Circle on the uh, delta of the Mackenzie River. So um, I mentioned that um, in the in the Northwest Territories, this whole idea I've heard this I've heard this often said. You know, the land is our home. Our home is the land, and this has been a very, very uh, important part of of then the uh, the whole building that we've done there. So this is the house that was designed. Again, we had a charrette process. We involved builders, we involved people in the community, and we, and we designed this duplex. 
And like the one thing I didn't point out in the house in Arviat, what we did as well, you can see on the very center of the building how we've clustered all of the, the, the bathroom, the kitchen and everything like that. So, so it's sort of like the wet area. We, you save a lot of money by doing that. You improve efficiencies. Uh, again, we have a, a sort of an open concept um, that, that works well with the families in the area, an airlock entrance on each of the buildings. And uh, this building was uh, rated as, um, um, with, the, with the addition of some solar on this, came at, uh, at Energy Guy for Housing 88. So this is really a, a very, very en energy efficient house. Um, this was uh, some of the early drawings showing what the, the house would look like, uh, the double wall construction that we would use. And that's another point. Every, t every construction method that we used, we worked very carefully with the local builders and, and adapted the whatever sort of method that we were going to work with to the, to the techniques and ideas that they felt comfortable with using. Uh, this is a section of the house, um, R80 in the ceiling, 50 in the walls and, and in the floor. A uh, very, very airtight uh, uh, building. Uh, and as I said, it has these uh, solar features. This is the construction of the house. This is happening during, uh, during uh, January. Um, you know, you're, you're that far north, the days are very short. Uh, uh, matter of fact, they have uh, about um, 35 days without any sunlight at all in, in, um, in, in Inuvik. Uh, we used a few innovations. We used the SIPS floor, and uh, we did that for, for trying to improve the, 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 the warmth of the floor and remove the amount of, amount of air moving through it. But this is interesting. One of the most significant issues we dealt with, it's shown in the, uh, I'll, I'll show you right now, this next picture right here. We, in trying to find, and doing this solar house, and trying to find a south-facing lot in the community, we could not find one. The closest we could get to south was 35 degrees off of due south. And so, you know, this was a, this, and that, that reduces the solar value, the solar, the, um, the percentage of solar gain that you get either from passive solar or active systems by about 15 to 17%. So then we did, we wanted to actually turn the building at an angle like we see it on the lot, but we couldn't do it because of zoning bylaws and building regulations and all sorts of things like that. Stuff that, you know, in some ways when you think you're working in a community up in the Arctic seems rather absurd, and it is. Many of the regulations that, many of the planning methods, many of the regulations and things like that that we work with up there have actually been developed in the south, brought to the north, and they don't work well. They don't work well at all, and they're things that we have to, have to address and deal with. So when we did a solar study on this, we found that if we were to try and move this building into a net zero energy building, it would require seven, uh, 85 additional solar panels on the roof to make it work. Now, if that was the goal, for example, that's not wasn't our goal, but if that was the goal, suddenly if you if you losing 15 to 70 percent of your of your solar performance because of the, not having the proper angle, this becomes hugely significant. So, I'm, one of the things about sustainability that I've noticed is not just the buildings; it's how we design communities. And the more that we begin to design communities and take into account, you know, orientation for wind and sun and things like that, the more successful we'll be in the future in doing these kinds of kinds of buildings. So this is the, uh, the finished building right here. And uh, right now, the monitoring of this building is going on. It's interesting, we, we've moved this forward too. We've, we've uh, using a, a remote system for, for monitoring. Uh, we actually then doing it all, monitoring also, actually for 15 months, for a 12 month period. It gives us three months to sort of work the bugs out. And uh, you can go online and you can see this stuff uh, um, in time. And it, you know, it's actually from our, we, we've, this, this one's working out really well. So lastly, the last project, I'll go through this quickly. I'm on the board of directors of a, of a place called the Coal Climate Housing Research Center in Fairbanks, Alaska. It's really a tremendous group and it's, a, it's an NGO that is involved in doing sustainable housing and buildings uh, uh, across, the, uh, across Alaska. So we were invited to come in and do a project in a place called Anaktuvik Pass. It's an inland Eskimo community. Still refer, they still refer to themselves as Eskimo in, in Alaska. They're Inupiaq. They're related in language to the Inuvialuit in the, of the Mackenzie Delta. This is a fly-in community where construction costs were $500 to $800 a square foot. The only way you could get materials in was by air. There's no road connection, no, no, they're 100 miles from the ocean. And so our, our goal in this project was to reduce construction costs by 50% and improve energy efficiency by 80 to 90%. That was our, that was our target.
So we did, a, again, we, we did a design charrette in the community and though we had contacts with there and we had been discussing things with people, we didn't know people, so we came in, we rented the town hall, we, we, uh, we brought in a ton of food and a cook and we, we prepared a big meal and invented, ev invited everybody from town, a town of 325 people. We had 180 people come and join us for a meal and then had a three-day uh, session in, uh, in the town hall just inviting people to come and drop by and, and share their thoughts with us. And um, we also reflected in that a lot about, you know, some of the traditional, the, the shots in the opposite corners were the, some of the traditional sod houses that people lived in. And then the other shots are some of the very terrible, tiny little plywood houses that they're living in uh, right now. And, and so we discussed this idea about, about how about building a, um, well, they also, you know, when we started talking, it's telling, talking, telling stories and, and sharing thoughts, you know, the, the local people really reflected on, the, on this, the fact that the most successful Arctic animals don't have to eat more fuel to keep warm in the winter. Instead, they put their energy into high quality fur and fat to maintain their body temperature. It seems like an inherent piece of wisdom that in our own construction practices, we, we fail to, un we, we just missed constantly. The most cost effective way of, of generating energy is saving energy. Every study that we have ever worked on, every project that I've worked on has shown that. 75% of the energy savings in the building is done through the building envelope. Once you get to that point, once you deal with all that, the last 25, 30% is what you start adding technology to. And, and that's what that is, is in this sort of inherent wisdom. The other idea that remote settlements once dominated by tent-sized objects that hug the, hug the tundra now consist of, of gymnasium-sized objects suspended in the air. People talked about that, you know, these huge, huge house, uh, buildings. And so we thought, let's do an earth house. So we designed a small building, and interesting enough, we originally wanted to build it into the side of the hill. We couldn't do that because, again, we couldn't get approvals for, there was no lot, you know, you're, you're in this community in the middle of nowhere. Uh, with all this room around and we but anyway we had a lot in town and so we decided we this is where we we did this house so again very very small house um, and actually that's one thing it's an interesting thing I didn't mention in the RV house and it was the same in this one when, when I was talk when we were talking with Inuit they would talk about space in terms of temperature they needed cold space for storing stuff from the land cool space for working on, on carving up animals and sewing skins and warm space for living in. And this house has the same thing. It has, it has an area for pulling a snow machine through for working on. It has a cool area that you enter in and then it, and then it has a, uh, the warm part of the south uh, of the house itself. Very small house, only 840 square feet. Um, um, and, and we also developed a whole different building system. We decided to use in, uh, steel studs and spray foam insulation because we were flying everything in. Spray foam we don't usually use in the north because it's, um, if you don't use it within six months, it, you know, if it gets up to the sea lift too late and it sits on the, on the shore all winter, it's no good by the time spring rolls around. Because, but because we were flying in and doing construction right away, and because, yeah, that was the other interesting aspect. In order to, to make the cost um, target that we reached, uh, we looked at how materials were being shipped into the community. And right now they're bring, being brought in on these big freight planes that were just cost a fortune. We found out that for a few thousand dollars, we could, we could rent a DC-6 out of Fairbanks to bring a uh, materials in. So we wanted to fit the materials for one house on a DC-6. That was our first design challenge. And we met that by using steel studs, spray foam insulation, and a, and a variety of other things. You can see in the picture down below how we carefully figured out every piece of plywood that we needed, every piece of material, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the house uh, under construction. This is uh, um, people in the community uh, helping us uh, put, a, put sod on the roof to create this, uh, a sod roof in this, on this building. Uh, doing some berming of the house uh, uh, um, with some equipment after the house was in place. And the results. Uh, the culturally based design process uh, and the design were well received by the community. There's a few more of these houses being built now. We significantly reduced construction costs from $500 and $800 a square foot down to $300 a square foot. For similar sized house, the energy consumption reduced from 1,200 gallons per year down to 150 gallons per year. 
and our and our our monitoring results at the end were within two percent of what we modeled this house to how we modeled it to perform. Uh, we saw also successfully implemented uh, implemented an innovative water and wastewater treatment system, and we dis demonstrated an advanced economical heating and passive ventilation system. We did local training and technical transfer, and and we got significant interest from other Alaskan communities. So. Um, just a, a lastly, for me, it's been a great pleasure and a great honor to work in the north, and it's been a, a, just an absolutely incredible experience. Uh, but I um, hear that this is my last presentation as someone from CMHC. I'm leaving the corporation the end of March, um, so it's a you know it's a pleasure to say this. And if anyone is interested in, I'm returning to the private sector. If anyone is interested in information and in these projects, please don't hesitate to get in touch. I'd be happy to share whatever experience we've had and information, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you very much.